First of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to come to speak, and I'd like to thank Svera for the, um, uh, if you like, dobbing me in for this uh, task, which has actually turned out to be very, very uh, interesting. And I think we've made some steps, but like many of the others, it might be just the first steps on what are quite a long journey. Um, the role of performance specifications has come up a few times, and uh, in this particular one, we're talking about performance specifications in external quality assurance. So in summary, I will talk about analytical performance specifications, I'll talk about external quality assurance, and then bring those concepts together to talk about where we are now, what, what has happened, and try and just touch on where some of the next steps might be in this field. This is a slide I put up in many different talks that I have the opportunity to give, and these are professional organisations that I'm a member of. And it's just an opportunity to recognise the incredible importance of these organisations, and in this case particularly EFLM, that it allows us to act in a, in a concerted way together rather than in our own individual laboratories. And I think it's, it's very wise that we recognise the, the importance and power and, and um, responsibilities that we have both to and from these organisations. As you're obviously well aware now, this uh, uh, symposium is based on work which came out of the Milan conference on uh, defining analytical performance goals um, and obviously references the, con the Stockholm meeting that came prior to that. There was the three main models and an important part of that was the concept that rather than perhaps a hierarchy you choose a model which is most appropriate for your uh, measure and and uh, that includes what data you have available, you would need to include the quality of the evidence and how all that fits with the particular analyte. Performance specifications can be applied in many parts of the laboratory activities that we're involved in. And just I say this just that although we're obviously focusing on analytical performance specifications, there is a whole world in the pre-analytical and post-analytical world for which we need to think about how good we are and putting criteria around that. And that's not the, the uh, topic for today's presentation. Also, it's been touched on in the previous presentation, and I will be keeping it very simple here, that in the analytical process, there are a number of factors which go together to make up the final result. The bias, if there is such a thing, um, the precision. Um, I'd certainly include the interferences or, or uh, influence factors um, that might be caused by the analytical specificity, or we might combine those in various ways to make total error. And we can consider analytical performance specifications for any or all of those. And we then need to think about where in our routine laboratory practice we might apply those specifications. Whenever we go to uh, select a method, one of the things we'll do is say, does it meet my requirements? When we're putting a new method into our laboratory, we have to validate it. We need requirements, performance specifications to say, is this good enough for me to use? We can use performance specifications to set up our quality control systems uh, to say, is my quality control system uh, are now allowing me to meet the quality requirements that I have? And we can apply uh, performance specifications to EQA uh, programs and EQA samples. From, again, I'm subdividing here and we're focusing on just one area, which is the application of performance specifications to EQA. That's not to say those others aren't important, they're just not directly part of this uh, presentation. Having said that, hopefully an EQA, which is the final performance of your laboratory, is capturing the factors that are listed above, but also captures some of those um, uh, real world factors of the quality of the reagents, how they've been stored, how they've been prepared and handled, your instrument, how it's been maintained, how well it's, uh, it is performed, and the quality of your staff who perform those activities. That all of those affect the patient result, and all of them should be taken into account in, uh, or hopefully are captured in the quality of the re result you give back to an EQA performer. So I think EQA is an excellent, and I'd perhaps even go further and say I think it is um, uh, the key place where we need to provide the performance specifications to make sure we're meeting what's needed for patient care. Just briefly to touch on terminology, um, quality specifications was the term used in uh, the Stockholm meeting. Um, the title of the uh, Milan meeting talked about analytical performance goals. Um, other terms that get used are quality standards, 
allowable limits of performance, quality goals, etc. The terminology that I will use is analytical performance specifications, uh, as that was in the publication that Svera was lead author on after the Milan meeting. Okay, I said I'd talk about EQA process. And so just to summarise that, there is usually a provider and you and your laboratory, and they prepare samples and distribute them to you. You receive them, um, measure them, return the results. That um, provider then prepares a report that you receive, and then you sit in your laboratory and you interpret your report. Um, and then you make, make some decisions based on that. You might say, that's good. I've confirmed that my laboratory is working appropriately. I, I can go home early. Um, alternatively, you might say, it's not performing cor correctly, and I need to troubleshoot it and do further work and, and work out what's gone wrong and will it affect patient care. And how do we make that decision? Generally, we use the performance specifications, or we may use the performance specifications provided by the uh, external assurance program. I'd like to just sort of raise another issue, though. If you like, that's the standard model of EQA. It's a tool that I use in my laboratory to say, is my laboratory working satisfactorily? But not only do they, but I believe that other organisations should look at the results of EQA performances. Manufacturers, metrologists, professional organisations should look to see are uh, collectively the, um, uh, is the performance of the multiple different laboratories meeting the clinical need. Not just one lab, but are we all able to meet that? Because if it's an analytical um, uh, problem from the, the standards of manufacturing, then we can't solve it in our own labs. And in the pathology community, we can look at those results and make decisions based on that. We can say, can we share a reference interval because the analyte results are close, the lab results are close enough together? Or do we need to have separate method-specific reference intervals? Can I monitor a patient when they go from lab A to lab B? I can only know that if I know the performance of those other laboratories. So the understanding the quality implications of EQA results helps me answer those questions as to whether it's fit for those purposes of sharing reference intervals or monitoring a patient. Um, it was touched on again in the previous one that a, a patient gets one result and often EQA is the same and uh, a single result includes the uncertainties um, or the errors uh, of everything that's gone into that. Um, bias, imprecision, analytical um, uh, uh, specificity issues, and they can combine, we can call that total error, we can call it the total uncertainty, but they're all reflected in that single number. Therefore, if we want to put a performance standard against it, we need one which, against a single result, that encompasses all of those factors. They may be traded off against each other, you're allowed more of one and not of the other, but it's a single set of results. Once you have multiple samples, then you can tease out the separate subparts. Is there bias? Is there imprecision? How big they are? Um, but when you've only got one result, by definition, you're restricted to assessing the total error or uncertainty. And um, I'm deliberately using both terms, so I'm not sitting in one camp or the other. Um, so when you uh, look at an EQA report coming back to your laboratory, there's several discrete pieces of information that you have in front of you. You have the result that you generated from your laboratory. You have the target from the EQA program. You can then calculate how far you are from that target, the distance from that target. And that's, it's assessing the size of that distance against some kind of performance criteria, some performance specification, which then allows you to say, are you meeting your needs? That can be qualitative. Yes, I've passed, no, I've failed. It can be quantitative. Oh, I nearly made it, or I'm 10 times the limit. You can use it in different ways. Just to try and put that in a graphical format, this happens to be from the RCPA, the Australian External Quality Assurance Program. It doesn't matter what analyte it is. It's probably magnesium, but it doesn't matter. What we get is a result from a laboratory. That's us with that little carrot thing there. You have a target from which then comes a distance from that target. And if you also have, or commonly have from a program, um, performance specifications, and then if your, your result is within, your distance between the result is within that, usually we go, great, I'm doing fine, I'll look no further. However, if our result is outside that, we may then take different actions. So the point is that the, the quality of specifications can drive activities and actions for labs to change what they're doing. Now, 
here I have a result, and if I don't change the result, but I apply a different performance specification, the same analytical performance is viewed differently and therefore might change actions from laboratories. So how the performance specifications are set will lead or may lead to different actions inside labs. And I'd just like to sort of reflect back that, um, uh, you know, to me anyway, a seminal lecture from uh, Professor Peterson in, in Sydney in 2005, all aspects of pathology are determined by comparison, and that's what we're doing here. We're comparing our distance from the target with a performance specification which we've got from somewhere. Now, how good or, no, actually I won't say that, how variable our performance specification. Now this is old data and I've looked around for some new stuff, but this is great stuff, it, it, it just shows how things are. This is a study from 1996, Carmen Ricos, looking at different performance specifications for different external quality assurance programs. At the bottom I've added on our ones from the RCPA QAP, I've also added in the CLIA guidelines, and in red down the bottom you can see the range of different percent uh, variation in, in uh, performance specifications for a range of analytes, working across cholesterol, phosphate, lithium, LDH, urate and ALKFOS. I hope it's obvious that there's a wide range. If you want it to pass easily, go and choose an EQA with a wide one. If you want to hold yourself up to the highest standard, choose one with a narrow one. But they're all different. Why is this? Um, and that's because they mean different things. And this is an area where I guess when we were talking we haven't, it's not really commonly addressed what they mean. What does it mean to pass or not pass the performance specification that is provided by your EQAS? And I, I put to you, if, unless you can answer that question, you're actually unable to use appropriately that performance specification. So EQA quality standards can be set for different reasons and they have different effects. So the EQA organiser might have set a minimum standard and think we want everyone except the really bad labs to pass. We just want to catch those, those really bad ones. That's a minimum standard. The other end, you might have an aspirational standard, one that we all the best, you know, that we want to set a standard so we drive improvement and make people push towards the, 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 the best goal that we can possibly have. And there might be some in the middle. And depending on the philosophy that's been adopted, you might have wide standards or you might have tight ones. What kind of response is required to failure? Um, for the, those that affect registration, like CLEAR in the United States or really back in Germany, uh, being outside has some regulatory implications. They tend to be wider. If the implication is that it's only for improvement, or not only, is to drive improvement, then we expect some to be outside and you may not be able to fix it. So again, depending on what you're expected to do in response to those, uh, EQA providers will set looser or tighter standards. What does it mean to meet the standard? If by meeting the standard that's as good as you ever need to be, that would be a tight standard. If by meeting the standard it just means you're not really horrible, but there may be actually you can improve patient care by having, having better ones, then that again will have a looser standard, might be a minimum, a, uh, a tight one might be one where if you meet it, you can again go home early, that analyte is working just fine. And then what is the clinical effect of not meeting the standard? Um, if, for example, uh, you can meet the standard and that means that you can share some reference intervals. If by meeting the standard it means you can optimally mon monitor a patient as they move around, it means you can interpret EQA results or results from different laboratories if you know what it means to have met them. So if the standards are really wide, you might still need different reference intervals. If they reach a certain standard, then you might be able to share them, if, as long as you, all the labs meet it. And really tight ones, maybe you can monitor a patient uh, relative to the biological variation. So we know there's lots of different limits. We know there's a lot of things that can be taken into account to set them. So how do we set them? And I'd like to thank Avia Alba from uh, uh, EQAM for this survey, uh, uh, run out of Switzerland, for the criteria that different uh, European EQA organisations have used to set their, their uh, performance specifications. There was 29 respondents to the survey and we can see that some use clinical outcomes, some use biological variations, some use experts, some use state of the art. So is it a surprise they're different? No, it's absolutely expected. We are applying different criteria um, to try and decide whether something is inside or outside the limits. So, to go back to our task and finish group, at the end of this uh, working group, um, 
uh, there was the plan to try and address some of these issues. At that meeting, I gave a talk on uh, EQA performance and uh, the, the need to uh, address harmonisation, and I guess at least partly because of that, I was nominated as chair for this, uh, this group. I'd certainly have to pause and thank every member for, uh, of, of, this work, of this task and finish group. Their cooperation, their enthusiasm was outstanding. It did lead me to um, just briefly attempt to uh, redesign the then EFLM logo, um, because I'm not quite sure why there was an Australian chairing the meeting. But I guess in modern times, if, if an Australian can sing at Eurovision, then maybe it is all one world after all. The outcome, and if you like, I'm cutting to the chase here, is that a paper has been submitted on behalf of that task and finish group um, in ClinChem Lab Med now. Um, and so it's under the heading of Analytical Performance Specifications for External Quality Assurance Definitions and Descriptions. And to a certain extent, these are modest goals, but we believe they are vital first steps to making improvements in this area. Now, for those of you who may want to take notes and things, um, while I was sitting in my uh, 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 hotel room this morning, I found the Google Scholar Greek uh, uh, section, and if you type in analytical performance specifications for external quality assessment, limited to 2017, then the paper will come up. So it's freely available for you uh, um, uh, to read when you get home. The observations that the task and finish group made, uh, and I've summarised some of them there, is that they're highly variable from different EQA providers and they mean different things. So before we can think of, for example, harmonising them and making them the same, we need clear terminology and definitions. And in starting down that line, we realised there were different components that are needed to interpret a, an EQA report and know whether you're using the right uh, 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 analytical performance specifications. So we need, uh, we need this terminology and we need these definitions in order to compare the performance specifications from different EQA. If you fail in one and pass in another, unless you know why they've been set, unless you can have terminology to understand the rationale behind it, then you don't know why you've passed or failed. Um, if you're a user, and I, my imagination is that most of the people in this room are enrolled in EQA, unless you understand the criteria that have been used to set those uh, performance specifications, then you can't answer the question of what it means to fail or pass. You can't say that, that um, it's, it meets your needs or not unless you understand what's behind there. So we need to have the terminology for, performance, for EQA providers to provide to their customers about what those results mean. And as I said, it, it's a first step if we wish to get to um, common performance specifications so that we can uh, at the very least provide to manufacturers some goals that will allow them to reach, uh, to, to satisfy those performance goals on a global level, we've got to understand again the, the, the components and the terminology so we can have discussion about that. So what I'm going to do now is step through the conclusions of that task and finish group, which is really just, well, it is actually just taken from that paper. The, I, I thought about rewriting it and thought, what's the point? Uh, that working group has sat and worked through that text and I'll work through some of that with you now. So we came up with six elements to the terminology to be able to allow a user to truly understand uh, a performance specification. You need to understand the nature of the material, and particularly its commutability. You need to understand how the target value is assigned. You need to understand what data you're applying it to. You need to understand what's being assessed, what, what analytical or what uh, measurement property. Uh, you need to understand why it was selected. And you need to understand the Milan model that was used to apply to it. And I'll now step through each of those in sequence. So, and this is straight from the paper, the first thing is the nature of the EQA material. In other words, you need a statement from your EQA provider that describes the material in a way which allows you to understand. So, for, and the particular key here is, is it commutable or not? If, for example, you're looking at results from two methods uh, in your lab um, uh, in the same program and the material is not commutable, then you are unable to make a valid assessment. If the material is known to be commutable, then you can make that valid assessment. And so the kind of thing that you should see from your EQAS provider would be a statement to say the material is known to be commutable, and they might provide information around that. They could say it's likely to be. It's a fresh frozen 
uh, serum, for example, maybe with some, some very minor uh, additions. It could be it's known not to be commutable, that the, pro the, the packaging processes and, and uh, material that's been added mean it doesn't work for that purpose. There might be specific limitations. It's commutable. We've tested it for these, but we don't know about that method. Or just that it hasn't been assessed, and then it's, it's a bit of caveat emptor. The next element which needs to be included in the description for a full use is the procedure used to establish the assigned value. Obviously, uh, in the definitions I gave at the beginning, if you need to know, if you're looking at how far you are from an assigned value, unless you know how that assigned value is set, you're walking in the dark. So we need, as EQA providers, to make sure that you're aware of that. And the kind of things that uh, may describe that would be that, that, for example, that EQA material might have a value assigned by a reference measurement procedure in a reference lab. That might be considered the highest way. Might be by comparison with a certified reference material. For um, things like therapeutic drugs, it might be a weighed in value. It might be a statistical process, uh, uh, all lab trim mean, uh, median, uh, things along those lines, where you need to know what's been used, what, what kind of outlier processes have been used, how that is, unless you understand how that's been formed, you're, un, you, you're, you're not in a strong position to understand the, why you might be a first certain distance away from it. And there may be other processes, but your EQAS needs to provide a clear distinction of how that uh, target has been made. And of course, that's recognising that many EQAS have more than one target. They might provide you with a weighed in value. They might provide you with an all lab trim mean. They might also provide you with a method specific one. And again, you need to understand the uh, strengths and weaknesses of each of those targets. The data set for the application of the performance, uh, analytical performance specifications, is it applied to one sample? Is it applied to multiple samples? Um, uh, if your program, if you've measured something in multiple times and taken an average, that is a different, uh, would require different performance specifications than just a single measurement. Um, if you're taking an average of multiple samples, then that's a different performance specification. If there's more than one and there's any statistics that has been done on it, for example, uh, uh, taking an average or uh, working out an SD, then knowing uh, how that process has been done is required for you to fully understand the, the EQAS process. You need to look at, no, be aware of the analytical quality which is being assessed. And this again harks back to the previous presentation. For example, if it's a single sample, it must be total error. You're, all of those things are combined. If you're assessing bias, then that must be determined from uh, an assessment of multiple samples and taking a, an average of those. Um, and then you need to know, and, and obviously a bias specification is likely to be different to a total error specification. And similarly, a specification for precision is likely to be different to the two above. You need the rationale for the selection of the, of the performance, uh, analytical performance standard. And so, uh, and this is just to put it in some, some language, you might, uh, your, you might have one which is, if you like, passable. You're expecting all decent labs to be able to pass. You might have one which really good labs should be able to pass, but you'd expect the less, less well-performing ones to try and improve their performance. And you move uh, further down to the aspirational. You might be putting out a performance goal where you're saying, this is where we want to be, and we're telling you that so that you can take some action. But that means that most won't be able to get there. Again, this philosophy of what the, is behind the targets should be available to you as a customer. And then the last would be the type of model for establishing the performance standard. So if uh, the, the uh, EQAS organisation has set some there, they need to say, well, it's based on, for example, clinical outcomes, level model, model one, and they should be able to say what data has been used. If it's based on biological variation, model two, where that's come from, is it uh, based on uh, precision, bias, if it's more than those, how they've been combined. Um, if it's state of the art, um, again, what kind of outlier exclusions undertaken, what, um, what, uh, what samples have been used to determine that uh, Z score or other, or value for Z score, um, which is in there. Unless you know that, you can't make that appropriate interpretation. So that, if you like, is the first part of the paper. The, shorter, the, the second part is shorter. And, and again, it's a recommendation from the task and finish group to EQAS providers and to, if you like, to you as users of EQAS to ask for this, that EQA, EQA providers should provide a summary of their performance specifications as well as a detailed description of each of those elements um, in the language where it's being used, 
and ideally in English so that we can, people can compare the, the products from different companies. Um, it's recognised that there may be different aspects um, in the same program, uh, so that some analytes might uh, uh, have commutable ma materials, some might not, uh, some might be set at, at um, optimal biological variation, some might be minimal. So it may need to go to some further deep levels. And I'll just show you an example of that. This is an attempt to provide, the, to use that um, matrix on the Australian program that's very busy. I'll just zoom in on a couple of bits of that. So zooming in now to the top left-hand corner, um, our general serum chemistry, it's not validated. The material's not commutable. The target setting is done in a different way for different analytes. Uh, the performance specifications are to be applied to individual results. They are an assessment of tonal error. The rationale is aspirational. We're doing it to not everyone should pass, or we don't expect everyone to pass, because we are trying to drive improvement. And we've used biological variation in different ways. So we can tell customers about that. Then, as some analytes are different, for just taking these three examples, that we've set the target for ALT using a reference measurement value assignment. For example, for transferrin, we're using median of participating labs. It's different, but we're telling you that. Um, our performance specifications to give the numerical values, and then we've used different values of biological variation, which we're telling you that it might be uh, within subject or within and between, and sometimes it's optimal, sometimes minimal, and we can argue about whether that's right or wrong, but at least you can see what we're doing. So, next steps as I come to conclusion. First of all, it's to encourage EQS, EQS providers to provide a structured description of their uh, analytical performance specifications. So you know what you're getting, you know what it means to pass and fail. We recognise that might be different for different reports from the same provider and different uh, analytes on the, in the same uh, program, and some may wish to choose, choose to put more than one performance specification. There might be a statistical one, state of the art, and another one based on biological variation. The next step would be to encourage EQUAS organisers to review their uh, analytical performance specifications. That just because you've used something for a long period of time doesn't make it right, and that to use these um, uh, factors, uh, if you like to provide a toolbox to check through whether you believe that the performance specifications are meeting the, your, your customers' needs. To a certain extent, this is an interim process that you know, one of the des de described goals was to try and get uh, the same analytical performance specifications to harmonise those across well, maybe Europe, maybe the world, why well, think small. Um, now that obviously needs to be a collaborative process with different equuses and different thinkers in the area working together. It involves assigning measure ands to the appropriate Milan model. I personally believe this will be a difficult journey, not an unfruitful one, it's one that we do need to start on, but we do need to recognise in different uh, countries, different places, different organisations, we do have different needs, histories, customers, regulations, program design, and, and that makes it complex. And so in conclusion, EQA is a vital part of laboratory medicine, uh, analytical performance specifications are a vital part of EQA, we need to understand what they mean, and so far we've gone to terminology and descriptions. We need to review them to make sure they match our clinical needs. And if we can get to the stage of uniform EQA APS, that would then inform uniform uh, uh, analytical quality requirements and support that around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Now we have one question. Do you envisage that TFG conclusions leading to improvement and standardization of EQA provision? 